I am Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And we're paranormal specialists who live in the most haunted city on earth, Savannah, Georgia. Every day is Halloween in our line of work, so join us as we spin true tales of haunts, murders, and disturbing Savannah history. I'm Madison. I'm Chris. And, and welcome, welcome to, to the most haunted city the, on earth. Bop, bop, boom. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the most haunted city on earth. My name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And we are very excited to have William Mark McCullough with us today. He is back from, uh, you know, one of our first episodes. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, we're really excited to talk to him about, you know, a Savannah haunting and all of that good stuff and actually get into the real nitty gritty of it now that it is finally out. Uh, but before we get into that, I do want to give us a few announcements. So first off, as you are seeing this, we have our merch line available uh, pretty much for all of y'all. Uh, so if you would like to wear a shirt like this or have a fanny pack or a beanie or sweatpants, all of the things, definitely go check that out. Absolutely. You can, anything you put a logo on, you can probably get. HauntedCityPodcast.com. That is where our merch is. All right. And uh, if you are a para junkie, you do get discounted merch. And for those who are on the highest tier of para junkie status on Patreon, then you always get free shipping. So really good deal for that. And then for live streams, we have a live stream Q&A coming on uh, November 6th at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Eastern Standard Time. And this will be for the Gribble House and the St. Julian House tiers only. So if you are not a para junkie and not a part of those tiers, uh, then unfortunately you're going to have to become a para junkie, I guess. Oh, well. <laughs> So there you go. Um, and then we also have a Bear Junkie only store for uh, merch that they can only access. So lots of reasons why you should become a Bear Junkie, but also just to see more fabulous content and things like that. But with that, I'm going to throw it over to Mark. Sure. I'm William Mark McCullough, and I'm so happy to be back here. It was great chatting with you guys the last time. Um, so Savannah Haunting is now available uh, basically everywhere. It's on iTunes, Amazon Prime, Voodoo. Uh, Google Play, uh, Redbox, uh, Comcast, uh, you know, just Spectrum. It's everywhere. It's playing in select theaters. Uh, I believe it's in L.A., Chicago, New York, Atlanta, Savannah, uh, Houston, a couple cities in Florida that I don't remember. Uh, but, uh, but it's easy to find. Just Google it. You can find it. But it's, uh, it premiered on Friday night, and uh, super excited to talk about it today. Yeah, absolutely. I, I actually got a chance to see it on Friday night, and it was wonderful it was an incredible experience and uh it was a packed audience so you know uh there is something to be said about seeing it in a theater so if you have the opportunity to see it in a movie theater by all means go out and do that because that communal experience of being in a big oh, room yeah. watching a horror movie together always great good gas good moments uh but uh let's dive yeah. right into let me just say the really thing uh, really quickly about uh, theaters you know, the idea of people watching my movie on an iPhone breaks my heart. So <laughs> yes. If you can see it, I mean, we work so hard on the visual. So if oh, you yeah. can see it in a theater, that'd be awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, um, I, I can't stress enough how, how wonderful a, a movie going experience it is. You know, and, and, you know, I just love going to the movies and, and we all do. So, um, and we are uh, the Savannah Underground podcast situation. We are filmmakers. We are all uh, people who work in, in, in the industry in one capacity or the other. And so, um, Mad respect to Mark for, for, for making it through a gauntlet because you had daunting. to film this during like the most restrictive time of COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, you were limited uh, in, in what you could do because of it. So uh, would you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So we were scheduled to start filming March 23rd, 2020. And we got shut down March 21st, two days before. Uh, we had flown our crew in, our DP, our cinematographer was, was in town. Um, I had a huge semi-trailer parked in my driveway filled with grip equipment. And we got shut down. And we spent, gosh, I think five, six months trying to work with SAG to, to get the go-ahead to start filming again. And we finally got the go-ahead in mid-August, which we were one of, the, I believe, the first 10 feature films in the country to shoot under the COVID protocols. And at that point, they were extraordinarily restrictive. They, they've definitely loosened up a lot. Um, but I had to do a lot of, a lot of uh, 
kind of magic on the script because we had scheduled and budgeted the film pre-COVID. And we didn't get any more money, but we got uh, 30% of our budget was eaten up by COVID costs. And then, uh, so I had to go through and rewrote the script and remove nine smaller characters. Uh, it was just so difficult. You know, the local film school, you know, Savannah College of Art and Design here in Savannah, uh, there were several students who offered to be free stand-ins. We couldn't use them because we couldn't afford the COVID test we'd have to have to use. Mm -hmm. uh, all of our extras were just crew members for the most part. There's one scene in the movie where we got, you know, legitimate extras, but usually it was just crew members like throw shirt on, run on, run on screen. Um, while we were on the phone talking to SAG, getting the go ahead to shoot, during that phone call, the uh, Savannah City Council voted to postpone film permits until I think it was October, November. This is August. So, the movie's called A Savannah Haunting, and we suddenly find out we can't shoot in Savannah. So uh, hopefully none of the city folks are watching this, but <laughs> there's still shots of Savannah because we just did it. Yeah. Um, you know, like we got, because we, we had no other choice, you know, we, we couldn't wait five more months to shoot the film. Right. Um, you know, and, and we were just kind of the, 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 the test bed for all these COVID protocols because no one knew how it was going to work and, and, um, it was the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. And, uh, but I'll say this, like we took extreme precautions. We did everything we could and we didn't have a single positive case, uh, during the sh entire shoot. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, uh, were they limiting like how many people you can have on the set? Yes. So <laughs> there was, first of all, there was a 10 hour shoot limit per day, mm -hmm. which anyone who's ever worked on independent films know that's, that's considered a light day. And so we had planned on 14 to 15 hour days but again, we didn't get more days. So we had to shoot all that we had planned in, in a short period of time. And then we were doing daily COVID tests. So we were losing our cast and crew throughout the day to go do these tests. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, I mean, everything about it was, was, was so difficult. We, there's a, a scene in the, in the movie that we use a really cool place in Savannah called the, uh, the powder magazine. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And, uh, the city of Savannah did allow us to use this because it's, you know, kind of a private area, but we were only allowed to have 10 people total on the property at one time. Wow. That include cast and crew. And in the scene in particular, there were at one point three cast members, but two of them were underage. So they wanted their moms on set. So right off the bat, you've got, you know, uh, five people that aren't crew. And so you throw in the DP, you throw in me. And anytime a new person had to come on set, we literally had to take one of the people wow. offset, and there was a city, a city official standing there, making sure we only had ten people there. So it, it, things like that were just so, so hard, um, but it made us be creative and think outside the box, you know. So in some ways, I think what we ended up with on the script is a tighter, um, more focused story. I mean, we had some what I thought were really cool kind of side stories and some some interesting smaller characters, but like I said, we we got rid of them, and I think it's probably in the long run for the best. Yeah, you know, it's amazing when you when you're given limitations that that's when creativity has to kick in. Absolutely. So uh, not only were you the director, but you were the writer. You wrote this based on experiences that you had and experiences around your house. This is uh, this movie is based on true events that it inspired by events that people. And when you watch the movie, you'll actually see some some documentary footage of people expressing what had happened to them. Um, can you talk a, a bit about the process of taking uh, the story that, as you know it and as you felt it and, and, and transforming it into this narrative you know, uh, film? Well, first I'll say it's so interesting talking to you specifically about this because, you know, as you guys I'm pretty sure know, you know, Chris is a writer. And, and so not only did you like come to my house multiple times <laughs> to do investigations as an investigator, I sent you the script to get yeah. your feedback on it before we mm -hmm. started shooting, you know? So it's very cool to like kind of come full circle and be talking right, to yeah. you <laughs> about it now. But, you know, I had all these experiences, my family had all these experiences that were um, scary, supernatural, you know, creepy or what have you. I knew from the very beginning that I didn't want to do a story about the actual people in my life who lived in the house. Because, you know, they're just... It, it's my family, and I, I was so worried about like you, you know misrepresenting them or them being upset. And I was like, that's mm -hmm. just that opens a can of worms I don't want to get into. So I knew from the beginning I wanted to to create a fake, you know, characters to drop into this environment. But I literally sat down and just started freeform writing all the stories of the creepy things that happened in the house. Just kind of 
getting those into my mind. And my writing process, I basically get a stack of yellow notepads and I just start writing. And I always start little paragraphs with what if. Oh. What, so that way I don't get locked into anything. Right? Mm-hmm. I just let my, and I write and I write. So my writing process, I spent a couple months just writing things down in notepads. And what I did here is I just, I probably would write 10 pages of events, things that had happened without worrying too much about the people they happened to. And I just wanted to kind of get them into my consciousness. Then I, then I kind of came up with the, with the, uh, the characters I wanted to be dropped into the house. And, um, so yeah, at that point it became, once I kind of realized, okay, here's the, the narrative structure of the family. Then it was just applying the supernatural things that happened to our family to those people. So that was, that was the process I used. Um, and I, I spent, like I said, the biggest part of my writing process was just writing in those yellow notepads. And, you know, for me, once I kind of get a good idea of the overall story, I'll just sit down and write the story out like I'm writing a, you know, high school, you know, high school paper. And then the next day I'll write it out again without looking at the previous day. And my idea is like, if I'm doing that, um, the good ideas will stick and the ones that aren't that good will kind of slip away. And after that point, I would do an outline and I, uh, the outline is what I really focus on for structure and the outline I get to people I trust, make sure it makes sense. So when I actually sit down to write the script, I wrote the script in probably two weeks, but I just followed the outline, but I'd spent a long time creating the foundation to write the script. And this was all in the house. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, the movie is, is shot in the house where these, these paranormal events occurred. He wrote the script in the house where these paranormal events occurred. And one of the interesting uh, things, and, and I'd, I'd heard you mention this you know, a few times, uh, there are elements of the script that, uh, that he, he, he came upon because of their narrative you know, uh, uh, function. Yeah, their usefulness. Mm-hmm. That turned out to become to be true to to be historically accurate in many occasions. Uh, do you want to touch upon that a little um, without giving too much away about the movie? Sure. But um, I, I find this endlessly fascinating because in in paranormal circles uh, there is such a thing as as automatic writing, um, and to hear that you you were writing handwriting out, you know, the notion of mind to hand moving the the pen across the paper that is in a lot of uh, there are there are um, mediums and and psychics who use that to communicate with the dead all the time is putting pen to paper because that automatic writing supposedly the spirit can talk through the pen you know can can uh, you know it's almost like a a very advanced ouija board in a way you're you're letting a a spirit move your hand so Mm -hmm. so let's uh, let's talk about the elements that that you stumbled upon Mm -hmm. uh and after the fact learned were true absolutely um yeah writing the script in the house was an experience in and of itself. I think I mentioned the last time yeah. we chatted that lots of things happened while I was writing the script that were very creepy. But one of the things that, that happens in the story that, you know, I don't think gives too much away, but there was a plantation house on the property and during the Civil War it's burned down. A hundred years later, a new house is built over the foundation of that, of that plantation house and uh, it plays a pretty important part in the story. And I just made it up. Well, once we got shut down because of COVID, we decided to do a feature-length documentary about the history of the haunting, uh, its possible causes, and we brought in a voodoo priestess. We brought in Chris and his team. We brought in a couple of other paranormal investigators, a bunch of mediums, uh, lots of folks to kind of go through the house. And we also brought in some historians to look at the history of the property. And what we found from the historians was there was a plantation house there on my property that did burn down during the Civil War. And I had no idea, just totally made it up, only to find out that actually was true. Yeah, that is so fantastic because, uh, and and Mark and I had, had a, a short conversation about that. It's just so amazing that uh, knowledge sometimes wheedles its way into your mind. You know, there's a sensation, like even being on the property, you get this sensation because uh, it, it should be explained that um, Mark's house is a little ways away from Savannah. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's just outside of Savannah. And uh, because a lot of people... No Savannah as the city that was spared. Uh, however, nothing in its path was. <laughs> you know, nothing was. And what was even more intriguing is when you start to really look at the histories, because, uh, and I'm not sure that this was Mark's house, but I do remember hearing tale of plantations that the owners destroyed, burned down before the soldiers could arrive. And in those instances, a lot of times they burned their slaves along with them alive yeah. because they were like, we're not going to free them. 
you know, we're not going to do these things. Um, and, and those are the kinds of stories, you know, um, as far as historic evidence, it's very hard to come by, but that's, that's like word of mouth stories. And I, I always thought that that this, the, the, the plantation in question was like in the Georgetown area. But, um, but upon hearing this, I was like, oh, that's really interesting because I've heard tell of that kind of event. And to have you uh, unearth it, you know, it's almost like it was something that was just in the air. Yeah. You know, or absolutely. it was just a subconscious knowing of sorts, yeah. you know. Or it could have just been something that um, was, you know, it could have been a spirit of the house who wanted that told. And they kind of just like, planted it on you and we're like he'll he'll just think it's him you know (laughs) and that happens to people sometimes uh there's so many different cases of people feeling like they um they know something but they don't know why they know it it's kind of this uh claircognizance sort of thing Mm -hmm. but very fascinating that it was able to be proven because that is the hardest part of it all is to actually prove that it happened right well and that's just it you know uh there's a there's an amazing event in in a lot of people's haunting experience where a spirit goes from being terrifying and oppressive to being very calm and, and almost, you know, kind and welcoming. And that is the spirit has an agenda. The spirit wants something done. And when you Mm -hmm. can serve the spirit, when you can do something for the ghost, you know, I need my story told, I need something happening. Once that happens, the spirit then becomes an ally. And you, you hear this a lot, like, uh, you know, uh, the, the spirit is very scary, but once you do what they want done, because they're desperate at this point, they're hoping that someone will validate their experience or their life or give, give voice to them. Once that happens, you run into this elation. You run into like, uh, you've served the purpose that I was pressing you for, that I was desperately trying to get you to do. And, uh, and we talked about this the other night, uh, uh, now that this movie is out and it's up, you find yourself kind of in a world of open doors and 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 a schedule that seems to work really to your advantage, uh, abnormally so, right? Right, absolutely. Yeah, it's you know, as a, I make my living as an actor, and our biggest obstacle often is scheduling because you're working on one TV show and you get offered a role in a different movie or TV show, and the schedules don't don't match. And literally the last ten weeks. I worked on a TV show, ended on a Friday, I started a new TV show on a Monday, worked for several weeks, ended on a Friday, started a new TV show on a Monday, so on and so forth. And then I just found out on Friday that I'm pinned, which is a technical term for, you almost got it, for a big TV show to start next week on Monday. And it's just like, that is unheard of in the acting world, but it's, it's, I think it's absolutely true. It's like, uh, as we're, like you said, giving voice to the things that are in my house, uh, I think it's just a little way of them saying, Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, and that's just, you know, it's like the kind of thing that you hear a lot is that once, once you find out the reason of the haunting or, the, or, or the, the, the desire of the spirit and you can facilitate it, suddenly, almost supernaturally, your luck changes. You know, you're mm-hmm. not, not just your luck, but, but your emotional states, your, you know, uh, this relief in the house. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of people have that sense, you know, um, uh, for instance, p- people who get their houses blessed or, or have that uh, exorcism experience of, of a house, there's a moment that goes from oppression to elation. Mm-hmm. You know, all of a sudden, oh, I can breathe. You know, oh, this is amazing. And it's because, you know, in a lot of cases, the spirit wants some recognition of their passing. And, and you bring in an iconic personage a priest or something to bless the house or to to give the house this sort of overlying because some people think oh you're driving the spirit away well you might just be giving the spirit the the rest it needs you know the mm-hmm. the recognition it needs somebody is taking it seriously in that case so uh yeah i i was it was funny because um i had gone to the premiere and i, I went to a little after party and we got to discussing it and it was it was one of those things where i was like wow that all makes sense you wrote a story about a troubling you know, issue, right. <laughs> you know, and a, and a troubling uh, uh, scenario. And then once it got to, once it's on its legs, once you're no longer, you know, really pressing on it, the doors opened, mm-hmm. all these doors mm-hmm. open. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and that happens a lot of times. And even the um, activity levels can change in a place when mm-hmm. you have something like that. Like I know um, Jim, y'all know Jim, my house spirit. Um, <laughs> when, after I had that dream of his murder, because um, I don't know if you heard this story, Mark, but um, my house spirit, he was an elderly man who was murdered in my house. And so um, his murderers were never found. And 
probably a couple months into us living there, basically I had this dream where I was him. I was in his position and I lived through his murder, which was very brutal and very graphic. And JT is like hearing me scream in my sleep. So he's like shaking me, like waking me up. He's like, Madison, are you okay? And I look over and he's standing in the corner of our room. And we'd had a lot of activity going on in the house. But after that dream, it changed. And he kind of was just, it was just a peaceful energy. Whereas when we first moved into the house, it was like, ugh, like very people, like you could feel it in your chest when you walked into the house, like something bad happened here. I thought it was the previous owners, but it wasn't, it was him. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's like that where, you know, they just need that recognition or they need to, you know, have somebody acknowledge what they've been through, especially in a house like yours, where it's been a lot of stuff going on, you know, where some maybe watch the, the way the activity might change now that the movie is out there and everybody knows mm-hmm. their stories. So it might get yeah, It calmer. takes the burden off of your shoulders yeah. a little, mm-hmm. uh, which is an interesting uh, uh, subject of the film itself, which is in the storytelling, um, something that that happens to a lot of people when they encounter something that they can't explain is they suppress it. Mm-hmm. They don't talk about it. They, uh, and, and so when you're watching the movie, when you watch any horror movie, you're like, tell somebody, <laughs> tell them. <laughs> um, but the truth of the matter is uh, when it's happening to you, you spend so much time and energy trying to reason it out, trying to deny it happened. Uh, do you want to talk about uh, uh, your, your character's, uh, the reflection of your characters with the the people who have had these hauntings and have, you know, because I feel like after the movie came out, you people started coming to you who who did acting workshops and everything, mm-hmm. and were like, I've been in your house and I saw this and this and this, but they wouldn't talk about it before. Can, right. You want to touch upon that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the one of the key things that we want to do with this film was capture what it was to to live in an actual haunted house, because I like fun haunted house movies as much as the next guy, but. Blood's never dripped out of the walls of my house, and you know, yeah. monsters don't crawl out of the, you know, out, yeah. of, out of the sink. Uh, it's really this sense of foreboding, and it and it just it's almost like the the walls are closing in on you every day. And and what you said is exactly true. None of us, us being family members, we kind of had a general understanding that there was weird stuff, creepy stuff in the house, but we never talked details ever because you always felt this one sounds crazy. Right. I'm not going to, this sounds insane. I'm not going to, I'm not going to share this story. And, but everyone did the same thing. And my, my producing partner, Alexis Nelson, uh, you know, she was always telling me, oh, when something happens, grab your phone and record it. And I would explain to her, you don't realize the first three minutes, I'm trying to figure out any reason as to why it's not something supernatural. And it's only at that point that I'm like, okay, yeah, this is something scary. I'm not thinking about grabbing my phone and documenting it. I'm trying to like not be terrified. So I wanted to make sure that the characters in the story reflected what I saw real people do, which is they keep their mouth shut because right. they just, you know, they just don't know. And, and there's a point in the story where the mom, Rachel, does finally come out and like bring it up and it goes badly for her and she looks terrible. And so again, she shuts down. And I think that that is something that everyone who's actually experienced a supernatural event who is, who is afraid of speaking out about it what happens to her is their fear that they will literally look insane if they share the stories. And that's, you know, the condition of our society. Uh, you know, uh, we, we run a, a, a paranormal podcast and people have been, you know, coming out of their shells about experiences they've had, but you, you have to provide a safe space. And the truth of the matter is the vast majority of the world is not a safe space for this kind of conversation because even stepping into the realm of the supernatural opens you to ridicule. It opens you to, you know, people who either have very specific and set ideas about what it is or people who just flat out deny it entirely. And and then you're at their, you know, um, <laughs> unfortunately, you're at, your, at their disposal. They mm-hmm. get to to judge you right. uh, and, and usually very harshly because you are challenging their beliefs. Right. You know, you're not just challenging the credibility of what's happening, you're literally stepping into their faith and into their belief structure and into how they function by saying, oh, you know, I saw somebody who was deceased walking around my house. Mm -hmm. 
And the moment you start treading into that area, people get very defensive. They're oh, <laughs> yeah. very quick to try to shut you down and mm-hmm. tell you that's not true. Mostly out of fear. Mostly oh, sure. out of, you know, don't challenge what I know because what I know is how I get through my day. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Well, you know, our trailer got picked up by a lot of uh, you know, film uh, sites on YouTube, you know, a horror film trailer uh, pages and such. And I was just kind of scrolling through them and looking at comments. And the number of people who would comment that, oh, this is BS, like there's no such thing as hauntings, there's mm-hmm. no such thing as spirits or ghosts. And I'm just like, well, come visit. Yeah. Right? Because <laughs> I've night. had lots of people come to my house who were not believers in anything supernatural, and it did not take them long to change their mind. Um, I've got a great friend who I've known him for years in LA and, and you met him, he, Chuck, Chuck, <laughs> yeah. uh, Chuck's a great guy. And, and Chuck moved to Savannah. So he was staying with me for a little while until, you know, he got, uh, got him to you know, figure out where he was going to stay here in Savannah. So was not a believer in anything supernatural. And about a week into him being at my house, he comes to me and he says, Mark, I, I don't know what's going on, but every night about midnight, my bed starts to shake and he started hearing things. And, uh, Things moving. He hears the footsteps. He hears the walking. He hears everything. And something he started doing, which I thought was really uh, inventive, is uh, he has an iPad, and at night he plays little girl TV shows, like on you know uh, the Disney Channel or whatever. And he says he feels like it calms down whatever's in the room. And I thought well, that's that's a cool. Kind that of is thing super. To do. That, that's a smart that belongs way. in a script somewhere. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, lots of people don't believe. And here's the thing: I didn't like I said the last time. I, I've always looked at myself as kind of agnostic when it came to these things. I, I was certainly not a believer, um, but I'm also I can see what's happening in front of me, you know. And 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 you know, I still say I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's deceased human beings. I don't know if it's demons. I don't know what it is. But I know it's things that that can't be explained. Uh, at least not with the knowledge we have now. Uh, but it is funny to see people who have no idea and they just out of hand dis- dismiss it. And I'm like, well, that's, you know, that, that's fine to do. <laughs> yes, Absolutely. You know? I love the internet comments that are like, there's no way that happens. Or my favorite one that we often get is why is there never a video? Mm-hmm. And like how you said, how I have videos. Oh yeah. boy. Yeah, there you true. go. And so, uh, like how you said, Alexis would say like, well, why didn't you take a photo? Like pull out your phone or things like that. It's exactly right. Like you're not thinking of being, uh, you know, wanting to capture these things. Cause a lot of the photos and the videos that we have as spirits are by accident. Mm-hmm. Um, people aren't going around, you know, being like, that's a ghost. Hold on. Let me pull out my camera, you know? So, well, you know, we, we, uh, we, we work on the documentary and, uh, some of the things we have in the documentary are, are security cam footage is from, from the house. And I used to have cameras everywhere and I took them down, um, because I kept seeing so many terrifying things that weren't people breaking into my house. And, um, so a couple weeks ago, one of our editors who's working on the doc uploaded one of the security cam pieces. We found this later, uploaded it to some website and he wanted advice because I learned later that since he started working on the documentary, weird things started happening in his house to him and his wife in LA. And so he, I guess he was trying to get feedback on, has this happened to any of you guys before? And, uh, so he eventually told me about it and, and I checked out the site and the comments and it was just so funny when people were like, Oh, this is obviously, you know, this guy's an editor. It's just made up, you know, whatever. I was like, he's an editor, not a visual effects guy, Yeah. but it's just, it's so clear. I won't, I won't give away what's in the video, but, um, but I have lots of, of, uh, I'll call it proof, but I have video evidence of things that, that cannot be explained. Uh, but still people would comment on, Oh, this is, this is obviously fake. And I'm like, Talk to the security cam company, right. I guess. You know, right. I, mean, I don't, I don't <laughs> exactly. tell you. Uh, yeah, and it is that 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 trade of, you know, to those who believe no explanation is necessary, to those who don't, no explanation will suffice. Mm-hmm. It's just a fact. You, you can't alter a person's belief with evidence. Mm-hmm. Um, it's only experience. Experience is the only thing that truly gets people to, to at least reevaluate what they're thinking, you know, because there, there's a lot of evidence out there. There's a lot of things out there, a lot of film of footage. And, but in the end it is, uh, and again, coming back to the, the film itself, uh, the, the, the notion of being inside a haunted building and, um, you know, the characters themselves are not spiritually aligned to accept this reality. So that gives you a, a, an idea, a notion that, yeah, it's, it takes great uh, 
influence to alter your thoughts. You know, something has to happen at such a level that if you, if you show up with no belief, what does it take to make you believe? Mm-hmm. And, and the movie illustrates that pretty well, that mm-hmm. you, know, you can explain away a lot mm-hmm. and you can address a lot. Uh, everything from you know, um, mental illness to exhaustion to you know, uh, the processes of the human mind all those get examined very closely and you say, well, you know, there are explanations. Mm-hmm. There, 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 you can, you know, <laughs> reason it yeah, out. Sure. Of course. Well, you know, it's interesting because my partner and I had a huge debate. We have lots of debates. Sure. Because uh, it's just the two of us. So we have to like, there's no third party, you know, uh, tiebreaker. Uh, but I have security cam footage of an event that happened in the upstairs mezzanine, uh, which of course in the movie plays a big part. That is so shocking and so clear. Um, and she's like, we, we can't use it in the documentary. She goes, no one's going to believe this. And, but it's, it's true. But her fear was that it's such clear evidence of supernatural activity that people won't, won't accept it All because right. it is sure. so clear. And that's something to take into consideration mm-hmm. because, because we live in the age of trickery right. effects, the ability to pull this off, being filmmakers and mm-hmm. saying, this is what we caught. It's like, right. oh, yeah, that's what you caught. Sure right. it is. And, and you, want to, uh, you want to maintain people's interest without breaking their, you know, bursting the bubble, as mm-hmm. it were. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's, that, that's a delicate balance. Oh, yeah. You know, it really is. Because if you do show people something that, that visually is irrefutable, that's how hard they're going to come against it. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the more solid the evidence, the more solid the argument against it. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, that's the, the, the classic UFO conundrum, for instance. You know, we're about to get, what, a, a huge drop from the government on, on a bunch of footage and, and, and information, but, but people will come to the table with knives oh, yeah. <laughs> and say, this isn't true, this is not true. Right. Um, because it, it does, it challenges your... Uh, your functionability in life. If you've come up with a way that the world is and you're, then you're told that's not the way it is, mm-hmm. that is exactly the point at which... So it, that's a good debate to have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do we challenge people to the point of rejection, to the mm-hmm. point where they reject what we're, what we're showing, mm-hmm. or do we you know, give them enough to raise the interest? Mm-hmm. And then when you, know, when you come out with your next documentary. Yeah. <laughs> well, for us, you know... My thing is, I, I made the movie. It was inspired by things that happened in my house. We're working on the documentary, but I'm not looking to debate people online about right. what. <laughs> you know, I don't care, you know. Right. Like yeah. absolutely, I, I worked really hard to put this out there. A lot of people worked really hard, and um, you know, I hope people watch the narrative film and enjoy it and, and have a good time with it. You don't have to believe one way or the other to enjoy the film. I mean, it is it's, it's a movie at the end of the day, uh, and they can watch the documentary and enjoy that. Um, but I don't care. You know, you can believe or not believe. It doesn't matter to me in the least. Something interesting that you could include in the documentary, though, is maybe bring in like a Photoshop expert or somebody who's an expert in tinkering with mm-hmm. footage like that and showing, because that's something JT does a lot, is uh, we'll take ghost photos and we'll uh, he'll basically break it apart and put it back together. And if it's not there, it, it'll disappear essentially. Mm-hmm. So that might be something interesting to just show like it didn't disappear or whatever mm-hmm. it is that they do just to give it a little bit more validity for sure. those people who are just so staunch mm-hmm. and just a extra little bit of content. You never know. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I mean, yeah. I, I, like you said though, there are those people that I, I don't know how you're going to change their minds, but yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah. actually a great well, idea. Well, and that yeah. shouldn't be the goal. Yeah. You know, it, it, the goal is not to change people's mind. It's to tell a good story mm-hmm. and, yeah. and to be on that. Um, let's talk a little bit about casting. Mm-hmm. Like, how did you find your cast? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, being more on the, uh, on, on the filmmaking side. Yeah. You know, what was that process like? It was hard. Um, you know, we, we set out from the very beginning to get the best actors we could get for the roles. So, you know, we had an amazing uh, group of executive producers who funded the film. And what often happens with low-budget films is, is what we are uh is they want to attach like a c-level actor who was really big 20 years ago so that you can ensure the dvd goes to walmart right right Mm -hmm. i I get it yeah i didn't want to do business right yeah i mean we had a lot of folks pitching us actors that literally 15 years ago were on some tv show and and they were horribly wrong for the roles they were being pitched for so for us the great thing was the executive producers from the beginning said 
you guys have creative control. Um, they were they were awesome about that, and we explained what we want to do with casting. That we want to just get we want to get actors who represented the characters that were phenomenal. And they said, "Cool." And so uh, we got a, a casting director here in the southeast named Matthew Sefik, who I'd auditioned for Matthew many many times. He's a great guy, uh, and he has you know good resources, good access to to the talent pool, and. Uh, he put out breakdowns into all the agents and got a lot of auditions in. And then he sent us his favorites. Uh, we had callbacks. Uh, this was pre-COVID, so we still had in-person callbacks at that point. And folks came in, and we you know, we had them read with us. And, um, yeah, it was. it's funny how actors, if there's any actors watching this, it's so easy for actors to get caught up in whether they did something right or wrong, right? to... to they go, oh my God, I messed up that callback or that audition. Or, you know, if, I, if I'd done this a little differently, I would have gotten it. And, and almost never is that the case. Uh, it really comes down to things that you have no control over. Mm-hmm. The way you look, your skin tone, your hair color, the energy that you give off, right? There's just things that you just can't control. Or we've cast another, another role with an actress who looks almost exactly like you, but she can't look like you, right? Mm-hmm. It happens a lot. And... Um, so I always tell actors, don't worry about it. You know, just keep auditioning. You'll find the role that's right for you, or they'll find you. But, but yeah, that was the process. We just literally, our cast director went through hundreds of, of audition tapes, and then we had callbacks, and um, and we we found the the people I think were perfect. Now, what's interesting, we had an actress who was cast in the role of uh, the grandmother, Vanessa's mm-hmm. grandmother, and she had to back out just a couple of days before we filmed, and we replaced her with uh, Simbi Kali who I didn't even realize that we watched her audition tape. She had not, she had not submitted an audition originally. She submitted when we, when we lost her actress and she was phenomenal. So we cast her and then I just look her up and realize she was a series regular on third rock from the sun, yeah. which was one of my favorite comedies <laughs> yeah, ever. Yeah. And so I got to play fanboy on set. You know, she's playing <laughs> this super intense, like really intimidating characters, kind of a little creepy and scary, but in real life, she's just an absolute sweetheart. But, uh, it was me playing fanboy and trying to direct her. <laughs> it was kind of fun and interesting. Uh, but that was cool. You know, we, all our actors were phenomenal. I mean, we have two little kids that were in the, in the movie um, that were such a joy to work with. I mean, they, I think they do a really great job in the film as well. But uh, sometimes it's not easy to work with children on set. And, and both of these kids were just amazing. And then all, all of our cast. I mean, uh, the mom played by, uh, by uh, Jenna Shaw was, was phenomenal. I mean, the, the arc she goes through in the movie is, is just mind-blowing. She won a ton of Best Actor Awards, uh, Best Actress Awards, I guess they're still calling that, uh, around the world. And that's something that you rarely see from horror movies. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and Dean, that's, a, that's a good point, is this horror movie is not uh, typical in so many ways. So you know, uh, when you're when you're going to go see it, it it plays out with this very amazing core of family, you know, dynamic and and issues that 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 are without supernatural you know connotations. Very difficult for for families to go through. So you know, it 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 does play out really uh, heartfelt throughout, um, you know, with a thrilling climax, and then. Uh, uh, <laughs> But again, worth noting is uh, uh, what's your take on creepy children? <laughs> because we, we talk about this a lot. Children are creepy. So They're very creepy. <laughs> children are very creepy. Um, um, and and uh, this is definitely not spoiling because of the poster. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, you know, there is this this uh, featured um, child girl ghost. Um, now that seems to be an experience in your house, right? Mm-hmm. That, that people have, have remarked on a lot. Can we talk a little bit about the, the, the experiences in the house that led to the creation of, of that character? Yes, that character is an interesting one because uh, at, the, at the risk of sounding crazy, I've had a little girl following me for years in different locations. Uh, it started when I was in college. I'd wake up and there'd be a little girl standing in the corner of my room. Um, when I was living in LA, I remember I uh, was sitting there one day talking to a friend and she kept, the, most of my apartment was kind of behind me and she was against the wall and she kept looking over my shoulder, kind of going back and forth. And I was like, what, what are you looking at? And she says, I don't want to freak you out, but I just see a little girl running back and forth across this room. And then my roommate at the time was Chuck, who's now in Savannah. Uh, he woke up one night and I heard him yell and he's a big dude burly dude he didn't not the kind of guy who wakes up and starts yelling but he said he saw a little girl in his room and um 
it's interesting because so many people have either seen or heard a little girl in my house. Um, you know, people who have visited, family members, you hear whispering, hear laughing, hear, uh, hear crying. Um, but personally, I would rather see a 10-foot-tall tentacled monster <laughs> versus a little seven-year-old girl a standing little girl in the corner. Absolutely. Way scarier to me. Way scary. And that actually uh, touches upon something that we've, we, we talk about in this podcast a lot, which is people are more likely to be haunted than places. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, spirits will attach to a person. And that's when, when you get stories of when I lived in LA and when I lived here and when I lived here, the same spirit, the same entity seems to be around. And wherever you've collected it or picked it up, definitely becomes, uh, you know, lost in time because you, sometimes you can't pinpoint when it started or where it started. But when a spirit does attach itself to you, oftentimes it is looking for the opportunity and the ability to show up. So like you, you bring a spirit into a house like your, your, your house now, um, that place is exuding an energy that can amplify a haunting. And so a lot of people, when they experience ghosts in a place, they may not be experiencing the ghost of the house, like somebody who lived in the house or somebody who had something happen to them in the house. The, the manifestation is a spirit they picked up somewhere else, but now the energy of the house is giving them voice, giving them, you know, ability to be seen. Um, so it, 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 that is an interesting side note is uh, you're, you're followed around by a little, little girl ghost, which, you know, <laughs> I am sorry. Yeah, um, seriously. <laughs> that, 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 that's not something you want to do. But one of the most common ghosts in Savannah as a whole is you know the little little girl in a white dress you know the the classic um and then to extend further it, it is obviously something that is in everyone's it, it, it present in everyone's mind is the little scary girl mm-hmm. um because you know Stephen King capitalized mm-hmm. on it the um, the ring series in Japan capitalize japan has a very scary series of little girls oh yeah uh, the little girl who waits in the bathroom for you i do not like that no no bathroom ghosts <laughs> yeah we've talked about that Hashtag no bathroom ghosts <laughs> but that's that's very uh fascinating that uh and and you were able to kind of corral that into a story um and if, when you watch the movie uh you'll you'll see that it's no joke because uh along with 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 creepy child ghosts there's also creepy dolls when God, you marry the doll. two, you're really uh, dealing with something there. Um, there is a, a creepy doll in your movie. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, so the, the question is, uh, and a lot of people don't realize this, uh, like Annabelle, the, the, one of the most famous creepy dolls of all, the Annabelle in the movies is not yeah. in any way, shape, or form <laughs> The Annabelle of real life. The Annabelle of real life is a Raggedy Ann doll. Which is even creepier. Which makes it creepier in a lot of ways, but but because we consume you know horror in a very specific way, we get these, you know, hyper done creepy dolls. Um was there a doll in real life that corresponds to the doll of the movie? Yes, it's from my childhood. My great grandmother mm-hmm. had a doll that looked very similar to the one that's in the film. And I remember it was in the room that I would have to stay in when I'd visit my great-grandmother. And it terrified me. So there's no doll experiences in the house, but the doll experience was from my childhood. Right, <laughs> was, gotcha. was, because we've all experienced it. We've all yeah. been in a room with a doll in Midland. Why? Why, Why? is that here? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and that, yeah, you're calling upon like really primal fears. Mm-hmm. Because a doll that looks so close to life, the uncanny valley of that inanimate thing should not be, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, looking at me like that, you know, um, especially when they, they doll maker is a little overzealous with the eye, mm-hmm. you know, creation. And you're suddenly like, those are really realistic eyes. You know, well, here's yes. what's interesting about that yes. because, you know, my initials on the doll was, was based on, um, like I said, this doll my, my great grandmother had, but I started reading about dolls and, and reading about the fact that, there are people who, when they lose their child, yes, oh yes, they get these grieving dolls, dolls. That, mm-hmm. they get grieving dolls that look kind of like their lost child, mm-hmm. and um, so I very specifically got one of those dolls. Uh, obviously, in the story, the mom loses her daughter, mm-hmm. and um, she's dealing with the grief of that loss and kind of the repercussions from from her daughter's death. But I, I wanted a doll that looked like it could be her daughter. Right. right. No, no, it's, it's, it's brilliant. And it, when you see this movie, there is this kind of immediate recognition uh, uh, of that. Because, yeah, a, a doll used to 
be the focal point of grief is going to carry with it a lot of mm-hmm. you know issue. And so when you have a doll that is so lifelike, but obviously not, mm-hmm. <laughs> it does. It, it makes you, it gives you the heebie-jeebies. And mm-hmm. if you've never met a grieving doll, um, I say met because they're all, they all feel like they're alive. But they really um, we actually used to have one of those here at the theater. Back in the early stages of the theater, we had um, an Alice Riley scene. So we had bought a grieving doll for Alice Riley. And that thing was horrifying they're rubbery and so it feels like and they got some weight to them so that it feels like a baby it's just so bizarre and if i was a entity trying to possess something i would mm-hmm. pick a grieving doll you first. would go for the thing that is most like a living being which yes. is the, the superstition of dolls is that a doll can inhabit because spirits are looking to be alive again and mm-hmm. so they will focus on entity uh, or or you know objects that seem like a vessel mm-hmm. you know most dolls either look like little tiny full-grown humans mm-hmm. or they look like babies. Right. There are very few dolls that look like seven-year-old girls. Right. That's true. Unless they're grieving dolls. Mm-hmm. Unless they're grieving dolls. Yeah. Yeah. Or American... American girl dolls. American yeah. girl dolls. I'm not, I'm not that up on my doll. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Um, have you seen the doll that we have in the theater? No, oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. It's actually the doll from my childhood. Um, that was my great-grandmother's. That was passed down generationally, eventually got to me, taunted by mm. something. Uh, I don't know what it is, uh, but... And we brought it here. And we brought it here. <laughs> well, JT brought it here because it lived at my parents' house for the longest time because I hated it. It always watched me. Its eyes would move. It moved around the room. And um, when we brought it to Savannah... I had it in my trunk and I got into three different like car accident sort of things uh, within that month of having it in my trunk. And so essentially it wasn't like anything that was going to hurt me. It was just like very big nuisances. Um, But eventually the doll got moved here and now it lives on top of JT's office. And so it can watch everybody (laughs) because it likes to see things, but nobody has to uh, be around it. But weirdly enough, about a week ago or so it moved from up there, and you have to get up on a ladder to get up there, and it moved to the demon room. It was behind a lamp, and it was facing the wall. None of that. None of it. And I came in, and I I walk in, and I was like, that's weird. Why is it down here? And so I asked our set designer, I was like, Shelby, did you move the doll? She hates this doll. She's like, no, I didn't move it. Why is it there? And I'm like, I don't know, but it's over there, and you got to put it back. So (laughs) (laughs) You got to touch it. You have to touch it, it because I hate this doll. Can't Mm -hmm. stand it. So, yeah. It, so what does your doll look like from your childhood? Because mine has like a christening gown on it with like bright blue eyes. And I feel like usually people describe them when they, uh, that are kind of like that when they're from the great grandmothers. Well, the thing that stood out for me with, with my great grandmother's doll was it was made of porcelain that mm. was oh, yeah. old and cracked. Oh, and God. so it was all these cracks in the glaze yeah. in the face. And for some reason, the eyes were black. I don't know why. Um, and so that's what stood out to me. And my, she had it sitting on this uh, dresser in the bedroom. And I just, remember every night I'd lay there, it just terrified me. Um, so yeah, that was really, uh, when you see the movie, you'll see that, that our doll has those cracks in her face and uh, has the black eyes. Um, and the, my grandmother's doll was, a, was an actual doll, right? like right. a baby doll, sure. mm-hmm. right? So it's, it's different in that respect, but, right. but that was the inspiration. But like, you're getting that inspiration. Yeah, oh, yeah. absolutely. Like yeah. When, the doll, when we were working with the production designer, it was like I literally showed her pictures of my grandma's dolls. Like I wanted to, these are aspects of this that I want reflected in our dolphin mm-hmm. movie. Yeah. It's, it's an effective prop. Yeah. <laughs> it, definitely, it definitely makes you think twice about ever encountering Anytime you throw a doll into a horror movie, it's going to elevate it just a little bit mm-hmm. at least. So um, I actually haven't seen the movie yet, which is I'm seeing it tomorrow, when, um, which will be Halloween day for those of you who are watching this because it'll be after Halloween. So I'm very excited to see this. Um, I've only ever been able to kind of collect the story because I know about your house and whatnot, but only get able to get like bits and pieces of this. So I'm excited to see it all come together and see this horrifying great grandmother doll, greeting doll. <laughs> I I look forward to hearing your feedback. Absolutely. Well, uh, this has been fun, and we're happy to have you back. Well, thanks for having me, guys. I had a blast talking about, you know, I I was mentioning to Chris earlier, you know, our film did uh, a a bunch of film festivals around the world, and we were very fortunate to win a lot of awards, and they would always do a Q&A after the movie. 
and no one ever asked a single thing about the movie. All they <laughs> want to know about was the true haunting at my house. <laughs> it's like, it's nice to talk a little bit about the actual movie that we spent two and a half years making. So. Absolutely. And, and worth mentioning that there is a documentary forthcoming mm-hmm. yes. that will cover that. And, yes. and, and, and we'll have you back on. <laughs> yes, for the documentary. <laughs> when the documentary comes on. And of course, the documentary is exclusively about the true events and the, mm-hmm. the real uh, things that inspired the movie. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's 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 nice to, to to take a step back and say paranormal events can inspire you. Mm-hmm. Paranormal, uh, you know, anything that inspires you should be explored, and uh, and things that scare you can inspire you. So you can go and create art out of your fear. So take your trauma and don't go to therapy. Save your money and put it into a film. That's that's the oh, key yeah, that here. That saves money. <laughs> Making movies really <laughs> saves money, right? It's very Absolutely. easy. You have lots of free time. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's great. great. Yes. You will uh, you won't agonize over it at no, all. No. Absolutely not. And then no. you won't be haunted by, you know, bad reviews and user views. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and TikTok abuse. And TikTok abuse. <laughs> or, or people online saying, where's this house at? Yeah. Oh my God. We're going to hunt house, it down. Uh, yeah. You will not know. Yeah. <laughs> so It is about two hours south of Savannah. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> yes. Gives random uh, geolocation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It sends you to it a cow farm. It was originally called a Statesboro haunting. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, awesome. Thank you again, Mark, for taking your time out to come and hang out with us for a little bit and talk about your movie and whatnot so well thank you guys for having me it was fun absolutely Absolutely. so y'all definitely go either see the film in person if you can i know a lot of you are out in la and new york so if you're uh, able to do so definitely go watch it in theaters if not go stream it have a movie night get spooky do all the things and if you go to a savannahaunting.com it'll list all the cities and the theaters that it's available and all the various digital platforms you can watch it there you go perfect well awesome um so we're gonna go ahead and wrap things up uh if you don't already follow us on tiktok make sure to do so at the savannah underground and also go follow our new instagram the most haunted city on earth you can find our merch at the most haunted or sorry i keep messing that up haunted city podcast (laughs) haunted city podcast y'all um and you will be able to find all our merch over there you can find us on patreon um all those things but with that my name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And stay spooky, y'all.